Welcome everyone. Uh, it's so good to have you join us today. My name is Rebecca Hickam, the Director of Coordinated Access at Housing Forward. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Housing Forward, we are the lead agency for the homeless response system across Dallas and Collin counties. And we work together with many partners, including nonprofits, cities, uh, the, the philanthropic community to make the experience of homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. I am so excited to welcome everyone to our first installment of our 2024 Hard Conversation series. Uh, during this series, which is now in the 10th year, which is um, crazy, we talk to guests from around the country as we explore the causes and solutions to homelessness. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to invite my co-host for today, the beloved and well-known Dr. David Woody, uh, President and CEO of the Bridge Homeless Recovery Center to join me. Dr. Woody is responsible for the provision of day and night shelter to 800 guests daily, the facilitation of 100 employees work supporting the delivery of homeless centric services and ensuring that the bridges work and activities sustain a focus on reducing the incidence of homelessness in Dallas. Dr. Woody, a seasoned licensed clinical social worker, supervisor, is a committed advocate for those living in poverty. Welcome, Dr. Woody. Hey, Rebecca, how you doing today? I am fantastic. Thanks for asking. It's great. It's, and it's great to be able to do this with you. Um, you know, I'm filling some huge shoes here. So um, just really excited about being able to be here and certainly to be able to talk about this awesome, awesome text. Um, just a few items for everyone who has made the choice to tune in today. Um, we'll be using the Q&A feature to answer your questions. Uh, if you have questions throughout our discussion, please make sure to use that feature uh, in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer as many questions as we can uh, toward the end of our time together today. So let's, let's just jump right into it. For this hard conversation, we are featuring Kevin Adler and Donald Burns who join us to discuss their, their book, when We Walk By, which they co-wrote with Amanda Bond and Adrian Bilgio. When We Walk By takes a, from my perspective, a really urgent look at homelessness in America uh, and shows us what we lose in ourselves and as a society when we choose to simply walk past and ignore our neighbors who might be in shelters, uh, in various types of insecure housing, and certainly those that we see on the street. And it brilliantly shows what we stand to gain when we embrace our humanity and move toward evidence-based, people-first, and community-driven solutions. Uh, the text is beautiful from my perspective in terms of just social analysis, looking at economic and political histories, and certainly and I think for most of you, you will find that their ability to talk about the real stories of unhoused citizens, it is incredibly moving and emotional. So please join us, Kevin and Don. Hello. Hi, Dr. Woody, Hi. how are you? Good to be with you, Dr. Woody and Rebecca. Thank you so much for inviting us. We're so happy to jump in and, and talk about this book and very thankful to have you with us today. Um, I'd love to take a few minutes to introduce you both. Uh, Kevin is the founder and CEO of Miracle Messages, which is a nonprofit that helps people experiencing homelessness rebuild their social support systems and financial security through family reunification services. They have a phone buddy program and the first basic income pilot for unhoused individuals in the US. Uh, Kevin received his MPhil in sociology from the University of Cambridge. 
and his BA in politics from Occidental College. And Don has served as an executive director for various nonprofits. He is a historian, researcher, and consultant on policy and philanthropy, and the co-founder of the Burns Institute for Poverty Research at the Colorado Center on Law and Policy. So Don received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University, a master's degree from Washington University in St. Louis, and a PhD from Columbia University Teachers College. Kevin and Don, um, we are so lucky to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome virtually to what is a rainy day in Texas. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, again, we appreciate being invited to uh, participate in this uh, hard conversation. <laughs> We're thankful to have you. Uh, Dr. Woody, you talked a little bit about um, the beautiful real stories of unhoused people that are in um, this book. And Kevin, one of those stories is the story of your uncle Mark who inspired you to think about this issue. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about that story? Yeah, absolutely. So it's great to be with you. Um, you know, I, really just stumbled into this work uh, through a connection with a family member. I didn't know much about homelessness 10 years ago. I thought about homelessness, but probably no more than the average person who's living in an area where homelessness is, is very visible and anything but rare, brief, and non-recurring. Uh, I'm in San Francisco Bay Area. But, you know, I had an uncle, uh, Uncle Mark, who lived on the streets of Santa Cruz for about 30 years. Um, and... I never thought of Mark as a homeless man. You know, he was just a beloved member of my family. He remembered every birthday. He was the guest of honor at Thanksgiving and Christmas. He loved talking with me about super burritos and just, we, we just had a really nice bond and he was my favorite member of my uh, extended family. So when he, uh, when he died on the streets uh, at the age of 50, I just started thinking about the issue of homelessness a little bit deeper. Uh, I realized that everyone I'm walking by, that's someone's son or daughter, brother or sister, or maybe some kid's beloved uncle. And I realized at that time, I didn't really see people experiencing homelessness as people to be loved. I saw them as problems to be solved. And so I had to go on a journey uh, in my own life to build my own capacity for empathy by getting to know my unhoused neighbors as neighbors. Um, and I know we'll talk a little bit about that, but just to tee it off now, you know, I spent a year uh, with 24 individuals who were experiencing homelessness, uh, inviting them to wear GoPro cameras around their chests and narrating their experiences of what life is like on the streets. And it was through the conversations, the insights, the anecdotes that I heard, including one individual who said, I never realized I was homeless when I lost my housing only when I lost my family and friends uh, that really set me on the path that I've been on uh, for the last 11 or 12 years. So, Yeah, I really appreciate that, Kevin. And again, you know, I think, you know, at least my approach to the work has a lot to do with just the capacity, frankly, to build relationships. And Don, in, in the book, um, one of the fundamental issues uh, that you that you all speak of is this whole notion of relational poverty. Um, what is that? Share with the viewers uh, what your perspective is on that concept. You're still on mute, Don. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> I am. I still have problems with quill pens. So uh, please forgive me. Um, <clears throat> as we were working on this book, uh, the whole issue of um, poverty became a central focus, but it's not just economic poverty. It's poverty of relationships. And one of the most uh, universal characteristics of people experiencing homelessness is uh, social isolation. And 
they don't have the kinds of networks of support, the kind of community uh, that uh, most of us have. And that is a form of relational poverty. Uh, in addition, I have come to believe that there is a, a second piece of this. And that is that most of us in our relationships with people experiencing homelessness um, have bad relationships. Uh, so that uh, we are as guilty as they are of a kind of relational poverty. And that has tremendous implications for uh, how we go about addressing homelessness. Thank you for that, Don. Uh, Kevin, the quote that you said earlier is one of the things that I highlighted in the book. And one of the other things that I highlighted was, uh, you, you guys said that as home and as human beings, we need more than just a physical home. We need a social home as well. And that that really stuck with me. And Don, Don I think you kind of talked about that. Um, Kevin, tell us, you mentioned this um, earlier, but tell us a little bit about the Homeless Go Pro Project and Miracle Messages. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, my, my journey into this, uh, this work, just giving a little bit more kind of connection. So, you know, I, my uncle passed away. I was sitting at, um, at actually his gravesite with my dad, uh, having this really profound conversation about, um, you know, what was Mark's life like when he wasn't at our family Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner table? You know, I, I, I was young when, you know, when, when I knew him, when he passed away, I was, I think, 18 or 19. And, uh, you know, we had this really powerful father-son conversation about, like, the life that he lived, um, how he saw the world, his flaws, as well as his, his beauty, you know, which can just his humanity, right? I mean, so that's for all of us. And sitting at the gravesite, I was struck that, you know, I was learning all this about my uncle, but, you know, at the tombstone itself, uh, you know, it was really just the birth and the death and then the dash and all the good years are in the dash, all the memories, all the stories, I've all the hardship, all the suffering, all the, you know, context. Um, so I, I get back in the car and I, you know, we're driving home and I pull out my smartphone and I just, you know, aimlessly start scrolling on Facebook or another site. And I just kind of pause for a moment and realize that I'm learning more about my random acquaintances on social media than I do about my own uncle at his gravesite. And so I got this question that really landed on my heart um, a few days later, which was, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a person of faith. And, and the question was, how would Jesus use a smartphone? Uh, or put another way, how might we use the storytelling tools that maybe we all have access to, to humanize uh, and, and to walk a mile in the shoes of people who are otherwise on the periphery of society? And I sat with that question for a bit and, and you know, the response uh, that I ended up creating was this project, uh, Homeless GoPro, uh, where I had 24 individuals uh, who were homeless autobiographers is the term that we used. And they basically wore chest mounted wearable cameras uh, for two hours, three hours at a time. And the invitation was simple. I just walked by you, you're still here. What's it like to be you? What would you wish people like me, passersby, knew about your life that maybe we don't? Um, so a few things stuck out from that, and that really laid some of the seeds for what became Miracle Messages. Uh, first, story after story, it was just, it was very hard to watch the videos. It was, it was heartbreaking. Uh, you know, folks would share stories of longing, loss, suffering, uh, I'm, I'm mostly just feeling totally ignored uh, as one uh, cardboard sign that, that for me is the most memorable cardboard sign I've ever seen on the streets read a few years after the project. Uh, it, it, it's very simple. It said, at least give me the finger. You know, it's like, could you imagine getting to a place where you're, you'd rather have a middle finger in your face than, than what you currently have, which is just being totally ignored and, and written off. So heard that quite a bit, uh, felt that. Also, uh, you'd see kids walk by and kids never just walk by. The kid is always pointing, staring, tugging on mom or dad's sleeve, 
why is that man on the streets? You know, what's, can we help? What's wrong with him? And, and half the time you'd see the parent like scold the kid and, you know, no, that's impolite. Don't stare, don't point. But half the time you'd almost see like the kid guide the parent, guide them, you know, to the person. And it got me thinking like, maybe there was something we just instinctively knew as children about basic right and wrong, basic humanity that we seem to have just forgotten or got so used to ignoring and overlooking as adults. Um, and then I think the other big highlight from that project was, as I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks, at some point in the course of every conversation, each person wearing the camera would talk about somebody else. And usually it was a family member, a friend, a former partner, a roommate, a classmate, a coach, a mentor. And most of the time, they were talking about this person with like a nostalgia, with a love, but that person was not actively in their life anymore. Uh, and as I kind of got into it and, and heard this individual say, you know, I never realized I was homeless when I lost my housing, only when I lost my family and friends, I started understanding what we've come to call relational poverty, both the fragility of so many family structures, how one out of every two Americans are a paycheck away from not being able to pay rent, and how so many families and loved ones are doubled up, tripled up, just barely holding it together, and how that's disproportionately true for folks, people of color, and folks who have been historically marginalized, discriminated, have fewer resources, generational poverty in our society, but also how the experience of homelessness itself is somehow this isolating, otherizing experience. Uh, where if you didn't have loved ones before or a strong social support or they didn't have many resources and you become homeless, you'll be you know, out of luck trying to make connections and form bonds outside of maybe social workers, caseworkers, and other uh, people experiencing homelessness. Uh, so yeah, hearing that story and those insights and just all the lessons from walking a mile in the shoes of our unhoused neighbors, it got me on the journey uh, to start having deeper conversations with our unhoused neighbors and can share in a bit how miracle messages kind of came from that. So. Thanks for that, um, Kevin. I mean, it just really underscores for me and in, in my work, just the importance of seeing people, um, not being afraid to, to talk to folks. Um, and it's interesting how challenging that has evolved into being um, over the last three to five years. Um, in the introduction um, to the book, you know, and you've described two or three things that I think are critical in respect to this question, but you and Don talk a lot about the factors, okay, um, that stand in the way, that are barriers to ending homelessness. Could you share a couple of those things that you all believe as a result of your writing, um, what a couple of those things really might be at this time? Uh, <clears throat> the title of our book, I think, um, really highlights uh, the, a couple of major themes. One is that we have forgotten our humanity, that uh, somehow uh, in the world we live in, uh, we consider people experiencing homelessness they rather than us. Uh, and the other piece of it is all of the systems that are operating that create barriers uh, to providing the kind of housing and services uh, that many people experiencing homelessness need. Um, for example, um, one of the things that has happened over the last 10, 20 years is a huge increase in the cost of housing. And simultaneously, uh, a virtual standstill in uh, wages. So uh, unfortunately, uh, something like 45% of the people experiencing homelessness 
are in fact working, most of them full time, but uh, they can't afford housing. Uh, so there is an economic poverty, but there is, as uh, Kevin and I and our co-authors talk about, there is a relational poverty. And somehow we have to address both of those. Yeah, I think Don hit on the main points. I, I think what I'd highlight one one high level theme in the book that Don sp speaks to is we really are talking about two types of systems going on. Uh, in some ways, there's the the kind of what we think of as the homeless systems, the the feeders into homelessness, housing, wages, as Don mentioned, criminal justice system. Uh, we could talk about foster care, which often doesn't get talked about. One out of every three young people who age out of foster care by the time they're 26 years old will experience homelessness. And for black young people, that goes up to 60% age out of foster care into homelessness by the time they're 26. So foster care, behavioral mental health, um, you know, we, we physical health. So those, uh, when we look at the constellation of broken systems, at some level you can't help but, uh, uh, but, but con conclude that homelessness may be the most intersectional issue of our time where all roads can lead to homelessness. And to Don's point, there's this other thing going on, which is it's also how we regard our unhoused neighbors. Do we see them as them or as us? We don't really talk too much about housed people, <laughs> but we talk a lot about the homeless as this catch-all monolith that encompasses everyone from the single mother uh, escaping a domestic violence situation with their child to someone who has uh, cancer-induced financial toxicity and has got the, the dreaded C word that leads them to chemotherapy, no longer able to work, losing their apartment, as was the case of Elizabeth, one of our participants, to folks who have severe mental health, behavioral health issues, to an LGBTQ youth who is escaping an unsafe home situation. So we've clumped it all together into the homeless, but then we're not getting close enough to get to know our unhoused neighbors as neighbors. We create policies in our cities that make it illegal to be homeless, anti-camping, anti-sleeping, anti-loitering, even anti-feeding, where there was a World War II veteran in, um, in, in South Florida who was arrested and handcuffed for feeding people experiencing homelessness on a beach there. Uh, to just the idea of deservedness in our society. You know, if, if we have a notion of self-made man, self-made woman in our society, in, you know, rugged individualism, if you're poor or you're experiencing homelessness, does that mean you're deservedly poor or deservedly homeless? Like, what did you do to merit that? It, it feels nauseating to articulate it, but that I think is the mindset that we have. And maybe most basic of all, you know, this is about the 50th, book event that I've uh, had the opportunity to do since our book, When We Walk By, came out in November. It's been a joy. I've heard about the same five to 10 questions at every event. And some of them are what you might expect, usual suspects. Why, why do the people choose to be homeless? Is it a lifestyle? Uh, is it all drugs? Is it for the weather? Uh, are they all mentally ill? Are they all drug addicted? But the number one question I get which I think is there's a glimmer of hopefulness in it, and it really reflects the disconnect. Is how do I have a conversation? How do I how do I not walk by? Uh, let me uh, add a, a one other uh, a couple of comments. Um, one of the things that uh, is now uh, very common uh, across the uh, social uh, situation in our country is um, <clears throat> the social determinants of health. Um, I'm convinced that we really ought to be asking a different question. What are the social determinants of homelessness? Uh, and this gets to uh, what Kevin was saying about the interconnectedness of all of the systems because all of the systems uh, really impact uh, the lives of people 
experiencing homelessness. The other thing is um, our book title talks about broken systems. And I am coming to believe that in fact, the systems aren't broken. The systems are functioning exactly the way the people who created them want them to function. And the people who are uh, really losing out are the folks at the bottom of the economic ladder. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, that's, that's a set of issues that we have to pursue in much more detail. Um, you talk about the big corporations. They're making out just fine, thank you. Uh, CEO salaries are, uh, they're now almost 300% of what they were uh, 30, 40 years ago. While the average worker is uh, making 26% more. Uh, that's unacceptable. So how do we get into that? How do we um, analyze the systems that are being created? And what do we do about it? I think your question of this like uh, focus should start to be on the social determinants of homelessness is a really great lead into this question because in the book you argue that social capital is critical for our economic well-being. And so can you talk a little bit more about what social capital is and why it is so critical? Sure, uh, I can kick this off. Um... Well, I, I think, you know, some of the research uh, that's been coming out recently has been even more and more conclusive, not that, you know, additional research was needed on this, but uh, looking at some of Raj Chetty's work out of Opportunity Insights at Harvard, uh, he's an economist and he did this massive analysis of Facebook uh, connections and data, trying to determine uh, what were some of the characteristics that lead to perhaps individuals having high social and economic mobility, uh, have higher, you know, uh, attainment of incomes, uh, you know, levels of, of, you know, success in life versus folks who maybe were struggling a little bit more. And he and his colleagues found from this massive analysis that even more determinant than zip code uh, is the strength of your weak ties. Do you have connections with people who may have different backgrounds, different socioeconomic levels than you do. Uh, and even, you know, we've heard before this idea of that zip code determines destiny. But if we actually drill down on that, well, what is it about a zip code that leads to such disparate negative outcomes or lower outcomes than a zip, come, a zip code that has, you know, higher outcomes? And what, what it is, is it's really, you know, well, how, how much wealth is there in that zip code? Are there connections with people of different socioeconomic status? Is there kind of that cross-pollination? So that's, that's for all of us, right? That, that is the power of social capital. It, it manifests in, you know, the ability in a neighborhood that has high degree of social capital, strong level of embeddedness, uh, being able to leave your kid alone at the park and uh, go about your day and not worry about something happened to them. You know, kind of people looking out for people. Uh, there's a level of uh, resources from that. I think when we talk about social capital as it relates to homelessness, you know, we use the term relational poverty to really describe it. Because I think social capital on its surface can feel like a fairly neutral term. You know, we could talk about high level of social capital, low level of social capital, but it's a very academic, you know, I'm a sociologist, so I enjoy it. But it's like, what does that exactly mean? Relational poverty, I think, reflects this deep lack of social capital that can have life or death implications for our unhoused neighbors. I mean, we know uh, as a nation increasingly, as the Surgeon General of the United States has warned us, loneliness is deadly. We have a loneliness epidemic. And yet, even in the way we talk about loneliness, isolation, there's often this framing of it in this very kind of middle class vantage point. You know, we, oh, we all were isolated during the pandemic. Well, as our unhoused neighbors put it, you don't need to teach me about social distancing. That's my life already. 
you know, uh, oh, we had to shelter in place. We had to stay at home to save lives. Well, ones if you don't have a home to stay in or a home that's not safe. Uh, oh, well, we all moved to, you know, Zoom and our work, and now we're digitally connected and finding new ways to, well, what happens if you had a job that wasn't as flexible, where you couldn't move to Zoom, or you didn't work, or you didn't have digital access to begin with, or anybody to connect to? So for our neighbors experiencing homelessness, uh, you know, obviously the pandemic was incredibly difficult and, and you know, ha had worse outcomes than we might expect uh, for folks who weren't homeless. But there's a level of isolation and disconnect that far predates the pandemic and is continuing. Uh, and, and so our hope uh, at my nonprofit Miracle Messages is really trying to bridge that. Uh, and I know we'll talk about solutions and ways to, to bridge that in a bit. But I think getting to a place where we don't see our unhoused neighbors as uh, part of a problem, but see them as perhaps closer to survivors of a wildfire or an earthquake or flood. You know, if someone went through a, a natural disaster, we would we we'd be embracing them. We'd say, "Oh my gosh, this is horrible! What a what an unfortunate thing that you've been through." We wouldn't be asking questions. Well, did you have the right flood insurance? You know, did you did you did you evacuate when you know the governor called? Did you? Of course not. That's that's not who we are. That's not in our capacity as humans. We 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 tend to respond with empathy and 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 kindness at least in the short term. Uh, and I think with homelessness, we have to uh, respond similarly. Uh, but until we get to know our neighbors as neighbors and do what Brian Stevenson talks about from Equal Justice Initiative of getting proximate, and I actually would say even getting more than proximate, getting relational, knowing someone by name, if you care about homelessness and you raise your hand and say, I care about this issue, and you can't raise your hand and say, I know someone who's currently experiencing homelessness as a friend, as a neighbor, uh, it's time to get to work. It's time to go beyond uh, maybe your comfort zone and get to know an unhoused neighbor as a friend. Let me even take it a, a, a level deeper, Kevin and Don. You know, here in in Dallas, um, our local continuum of care has really begun to intentionally look at issues yeah. of um, equity within our systems. OK, and um, uh, about six years ago, um, a group came in and did assessment of five communities called the Spark Report. And one of the issues they talk about is um, how there are challenges within communities um, because of a lack of capital within the community and that that can spawn issues. Um, talk a little bit about the, the issue of social capital and how it might intersect with uh, racist structures, racial systems. Um, what does that look like uh, for folks that you all engage, that you talk with um, in preparation for the book? Uh, let me uh, <clears throat> unpack social capital a little bit. Uh, people ask me, so what do you mean by social capital? And my response is, who do you call at two o'clock in the morning if you have a crisis? Uh, we all have people, a spouse, uh, a neighbor, a friend, uh, people at church, uh, or whatever. Um, and we can rely on people to help us uh, deal with the crisis. People experiencing homelessness don't have that. They don't have that kind of network of support. Uh, they don't have the kind of community that they can rely on. One of the <clears throat> terms that we talk about in the book is uh, network impoverishment and uh, some very good people, including uh, the guy who is now the uh, executive director of the US Interagency Council on Homelessness, uh, worked on uh, a <clears throat> series of, of um, research issues. 
And one of the things that it discovered was, uh, in particularly in black communities, is that um, there may be a community, but the community members are not in a position to help very much. They don't have the economic wherewithal to provide much support. And so they coined the term uh, network uh, impoverishment. Uh, and, you know, people ask me, well, you look at some of the tent encampments and people seem to know each other. Yeah, they do know each other, but those folks are not in a position to provide much help. Uh, so, uh, yes, it is a community, but it's not a, um, a strong social capital environment. Yeah, and Don, I think, really uh, laid out some of the foundational pieces and just a common sense understanding social capital really well. I think one aspect I want to highlight uh, that came that I, I, you know, we found in our research that I think really speaks to the questions of equity that you're getting at. Um, so one interesting finding that took, you know, a, a minute to kind of have a conversation about was that uh, black individuals who fall into homelessness uh, tend to fall into homelessness at rates of lower mental and behavioral health issues and higher incomes than white people. Meaning if you're a white person and uh, you know you fall into homelessness, uh, the, the severity of mental behavioral health issues tends to be a lot greater. And, and a person who's African-American, it, it tends to be less falling into the homelessness. So why is that? Why is that? And what we're really finding is that you have to look at uh, intergenerational poverty, uh, systems of oppression, exclusion, inequity, where families, African-American families, as we all know, ongoing and historically and continued to the present day and through the present day, uh, have not had the same opportunities for wealth generation, uh, building resources. And if you have that on a family level and then you have multiple families together and those families are also experiencing the same traumas, the same disconnects, suddenly it, it, it's, it becomes that much harder to have a strong buffer from falling over the edge. It's actually remarkable. Uh, we have, you know, it's three times the, the population of African-Americans in the U.S. Uh, is about three times over indexed among the homeless population. It's actually a, a remarkable testament uh, to the resiliency of so many uh, African-American families that uh, it's not higher. Um, you know, I, I just, and, and, you know, and this is, we're speaking, you know, specifically about African-Americans here. This applies to uh, many groups on the margins of society. I just got back from um, Minnesota, did some client work there, and I'll just share a, a brief story of an individual there. So it actually, there's a connection to my own story. So let me just share this. So yesterday, uh, it's March 21st. Uh, that's that's actually, it, it's my worst day of the year. It's the hardest day for me. That's the day I lost my mom. Uh, she had breast cancer. Uh, she passed away when I was 23 years old, uh, 16 years ago yesterday. And even though this was, you know, the most painful moment of my life, uh, you know, to date, um, you know, it was rock bottom was was hard, uh, but I had friends, family that uh, helped me get through it. I moved back into my childhood home and it was abandoned and I got it ready for rental. But even during that time, I had three or four friends uh, couches that I would stay at and sleep on just to kind of have some kind of connectivity. And they got me through this period as a 23 year old, you know, really not even able to grieve the loss of my mom at this formative stage ended up creating my first nonprofit because I didn't need to immediately think about money. I could kind of create something. And that led me on my journey as a social entrepreneur to eventually creating miracle messages. Now, I met an individual in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, while I was there. His name, uh, incidentally, is Devin. So Kevin and Devin. 
And uh, how much separates us beyond just one or two letters is incredible. He's a Native American man. Uh, when he was 13 years old, uh, he experienced the worst day of his life on March 21st, 2005, the exact same day that I had my worst day. And on that day for him, uh, his nephew uh, got a hold of his father's handgun on the Indi on the Native American reservation in, in where he was living in Minnesota and shot his mom, his dad, uh, went to the school and shot other community members and then shot himself. And his parents were the first two casualties uh, in what became known as, I believe it's the Red Lake shooting, uh, which happened on the reservation. He was 13 years old at the time. So what happened to him uh, is he was first traumatized having, you know, seen parts of this horrific shooting and then just, you know, he's 13 years old. He moves in with his grandma on the reservation. You know, by all accounts, talking to him, she was just an incredible human being, tried to hold it together as best she could. She lived in a two-bedroom apartment with 16 people in that apartment. Oh. 16 people. And they they got by. It was a bit chaotic, but uh, she really tried to hold it together with, with love, resiliency. And she passed away uh, about eight or nine years after the shooting. He was 21, 22 years old. At that point, he became homeless, uh, unsheltered homeless. And he's been on the streets ever since, in and out of the incarceration system, uh, getting, you know, uh, drug offenses and, and you know, trying to self-medicate. And when I met him, he feels ashamed of choices he's made, things. He feels like he wishes he was a better father of this. And I'm standing there, I'm just like, I cannot believe how badly our systems have failed you. What tragedies you've faced. Now, uh, it's a whole, I, I can't imagine a tragedy like that even begin to compute it, but just the, the lack of the historical traumas, the intergenerational poverty, the lack of resources. There were so many moments when we talk about homelessness, we also have to talk about the need to prevent homelessness before it begins. And that's where I look at family, social support, social capital structures, and how government should really be investing to strengthen the families and communities and units of support that are right now barely keeping people, one out of two Americans, from falling over the edge into homelessness or a paycheck away from not paying rent. That's the work to do. So to me, that is really the intersection of equity and social capital beyond the buzzwords, beyond the nice lip service, beyond the checking of the boxes. You got to invest in people. You got to invest in communities. Wow. Thank you for sharing one, your personal story about your mom and Devin's story. Yeah, I think that's a really great example of all of the things that you talk about in chapter one. Thanks, um, Rebecca. And you know what? I'll just share as a little ask, uh, a postscript to that. I told him I'd be thinking about him uh, yesterday and praying for him and he looked at me and he said i'm going to be praying for you and thinking about you as well you know i, I just I, I share that because even in the midst of tragedy and hardship you know fundamentally it's part of the human experience and our unhoused neighbors may have had a really rough hand much rougher than anything i could imagine but there's a solidarity there there's a share that's the hard day for both of us and i'll never have another day of march 21st without thinking about Devin. and there's no world in which he should be homeless there's no one should be homeless, but you hear that you're like, this guy should not be homeless. Our society, we got to do something about it. So. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to skip us forward just a little bit. Um, we're going to move into chapter two. Uh, so we don't think that deeply. Um, we don't often think that deeply about the nature and function of stigma. Can we, can you kind of tell us a little bit about stigma, what, what it's really all about and what role it plays in homelessness? Uh, <clears throat> this is a very complicated issue. Uh, and I would argue that uh, the primary reason we have not done a more adequate job of addressing homelessness is because most of us, have uh, a series of negative stereotypes and stigma 
uh, regarding people experiencing homelessness. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that is absolutely critical is um, people tend to think about uh, folks that they see on the streets uh, and this gets into uh, confirmation bias and, and uh, uh, some other uh, aspects of this. And they assume that everybody uh, is exactly like uh, the folks that they see on the streets. Uh, in point of fact, that's dead wrong. Uh, folks on the streets represent a relatively small proportion of the total population of people experiencing homelessness. Um, and it's, um, as I said before, it's people who are working, uh, can't afford rent. Uh, it's survivors of domestic violence. Uh, it's students uh, at all levels uh, <clears throat> and other folks uh, who uh, are, um, they're not alcoholics, they're not drug addicted, uh, they're not <clears throat> mentally ill, uh, and we don't see that because we have these uh, stereotypes in our mind. Um, and I would argue that because of the stereotypes, there isn't the kind of push or constituency to force uh, decision makers to create more resources for people experiencing homelessness. Um, basically, we know what to do. We don't do it because we don't have the resources. And you look at things like um, turnover rates for uh, case managers. Uh, and I see uh, Dr. Woody uh, nodding like man. Um, we don't pay case managers enough because we don't have the resources to do it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I see him throw up his hands and, and, and right. Um, we don't create the kind of housing we need because decision makers uh, are hearing from various people that they don't want those kinds of facilities in their neighborhood. Um, and it's all because of these negative stereotypes and the stigma. And a lot of that is based on either total uh, ignorance or misinformation. And it seems to me that one of the things that we really have to do is go on a, a major campaign to create the kinds of uh, constructive uh, description of people experiencing homelessness. One of the things, and I hadn't quite figured out, I, I'm counting on Kevin to solve this problem for me. Uh, Babies are not born with attitudes. Uh, kids, as they're growing up, they learn attitudes from their parents, uh, kids, other kids at school, uh, from church, uh, from the playground, et cetera, et cetera. How do we create curricular materials that provide a constructive positive attitude about people experiencing homelessness. Um, and we don't do it. I mean, there's one uh, organization in Houston, actually, that has done some good stuff about this. And I've seen their material. It's terrific. Uh, and they have material for uh, younger kids, for uh, <clears throat> Uh, so <clears throat> mid-teens and then for older teens. And the materials are really very good. 
why don't why are we not providing that kind of material uh, around the country? And part of the answer is because a lot of people say, well, that's woke uh, and uh, we can't possibly uh, <clears throat> include that kind of material in our curriculum. Um, but that's all based on these negative stereotypes uh, of the stigma. You, 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 I appreciate that, Don. And, you know, you, I, you I have identified uh, some of my tough points as a, as a leader, you know, in this space. I mean, even to take it a step further, I would tell you that, you know, one of the things that you all talk about in the book is this whole notion, again, of, of stigma consciousness. And just a couple of days ago, um, I was going to our guest town hall on, on the campus. And I walked, I was, I was dressed like this, but I had on a hoodie mm. and I had my hood up. And people didn't recognize me. Even, and it's not just guests, employees. Oh, oh, Dr. Woody, I didn't know it was you. Uh, and what I would say to you is that there, there are some, some stigmas that are attached to even a person, an African-American person like me. What can you all tell us about this, the whole notion of stigma consciousness? Well, I, I can jump in on that. It, it's, um, I, I try to elevate the voices and stories of our unhoused neighbors where I can. And what I'll share is, uh, you know, at Miracle Messages, the programs we do, so we do family reunification services, a phone buddy program, matching volunteers all over the world for weekly phone calls and text messages and basic income, giving people money, no strings attached. Uh, in the family reunification piece, uh, I've probably had at this point well over a thousand mm -hmm. conversations with unhoused neighbors, offering them a chance to record a message to a loved one that maybe they haven't seen in months, years, or in some cases, decades. When a person says they wanna reconnect, but then they change their mind, and they say, oh, you know, I don't want to bother. No, let's not do it. Sometimes, you know, there's reasons why they've already been disconnected. There's digital literacy barriers. Sometimes there's bureaucratic barriers, you know, where shelters don't confirm or deny whether someone's at a facility out of fear of violating HIPAA. But the number one reason folks are disconnected is emotional barriers, feelings of shame. And so when I ask someone, would you like to reconnect? And they say yes, and they change their mind. The most common response that I hear is, I can't, I feel dirty. This internalized sense of worthlessness that you don't want to be a burden. Literally, you'd rather keep at arm's length and distance the people who may be thinking about you going to bed every night, waking up in the morning, who would want to be that 2 a.m., 3 a.m. call that Don talked about. And yet you feel so dirty and self-loathing and hyper aware of your own stigma, stigma consciousness, that you'd rather keep them at arm's length because the fear of rejection or the fear of being a burden is just so pronounced. And so uh, for me, that that to me sums up this, this notion. It's something that we're all complicit in. We may not all be guilty, but we're all complicit. And so it's it's incumbent on us to counter the bad with the better. I mean, the neuroscience on this is clear. Uh, Princeton and Duke neuroscientists found that the part of our brain that activates when we see a person compared to an inanimate object, this is the medial prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain has been found not to respond, not to activate, when we see someone that we perceive as homeless. Literally that the, the neurons, the firing of our brains that's happening right now as we look at each other's beautiful faces, that does not happen when we see someone who's experiencing homelessness. The parts of the brain that do activate are the regions associated with disgust, nausea, as if you just saw throw up or vomit. And the implications of this, a few years ago, the New York City Rescue Mission did an experiment where they had members of a person's very own family dress up to look homeless as their family members walked by. And not a single person recognized their own mom or dad, brother or sister, son or daughter, as they walked by them on the streets. 
So uh, that to me is where we start. That That's not where we originate, as Don said, as babies, uh, as, as children, we have much more of a receptivity. We don't recognize the variations in faces, skin types. I think maybe it starts setting in around three months of age, it starts having, but you know, from there, it's just a cascade into adulthood. And I think we have to you know, proactively counter that. Otherwise, we hear stories of our unhoused neighbors saying, I can't, I feel dirty. And when I hear that, I say, well, what can we do to make you feel that you're not dirty? Uh, that in fact, the society that has such wealth and such a high degree of homelessness, there's, that's the, that's the shame. That's the dirtiness. It's not on you, brother. Uh, <clears throat> to uh, follow up on what uh, Kevin said, uh, I worked with a, a uh, I was going to say a young woman. She wasn't so young. She was a 58-year-old grandmother, uh, <clears throat> uh, a black uh, woman uh, who had grandchildren. Um, and she decided, oh, she was in the uh, military, in the Marines, I think. And um, she claimed that her commanding officer sexually abused her. She filed a suit, she won the suit. And then in their infinite wisdom, uh, the people reassigned her to the same commanding officer, uh, which you know I, I, I just find uh, incredible. I ended up hiring her when I discovered that she had been experiencing homelessness. She came to Denver to finish up her bachelor's degree, and she had been promised uh, a, <clears throat> a nice uh, tuition uh, assistance grant. She got here and discovered that somebody had goofed and had forgotten to check the box that she was a veteran. So th the grant disappeared. She ended up living uh, at a shelter for almost two years. During that time, she was an intern in the governor's office. She was an intern in a state uh, representative's office. Nobody, but nobody knew that she was experiencing homelessness. And what I discovered uh, I hired her uh, and we worked together very closely for a couple of years. What I discovered was that her family was more than able to provide her the kind of financial assistance that she needed. But she was too ashamed. And some of her family still, six years later, still don't know that she experienced homelessness because of her shame. Wow. Kevin, I think what you were talking about, um, you refer in the book as the stereotype content model, and you talked about how it quite literally dehumanize, allows us to dehumanize our unhoused neighbors. How does that dehumanization alleviate our discomfort with the existence of homelessness? Yeah, gosh. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm loving this conversation. I'm going to try to be a little briefer because we're going to be, uh, this is like a 12 part series, y'all, right? Like this is, <laughs> I'm going to, so I'm going to do my part. Um, so just, just, you know, speaking briefly, um, you know, I, I think we, we've basically um, looked at homelessness as a criminal matter rather than a community matter. It really comes down to that. So all of our services, how we respond, it's very top-down, system-driven, punitive. There's a lot of paternalism in it, a lot of assumptions that we know better than you because you've done something wrong. Otherwise, why wouldn't you be homeless? And a community matter is opposite. Uh, imagine if, God God forbid, one of us were to become homeless. You'd, for, you'd know the context. You'd know the situation. You'd, you'd know, you know, what things went wrong that had to go wrong. And it's usually not just one thing. It's a cascade of things. Uh, so I, I, I just think being aware of 
how we perpetuate that, not only in our systems of community response, police response, how we handle homelessness, but even how we talk about homelessness. I try to be very intentional about language, people experiencing homelessness. So let me leave it at that. I mean, you, you, I appreciate that response, Kevin, because again, you know, the significance of paternalism in the book, you know, kind of is beautifully discussed, described and with great examples. In chapter five, you talk about this, the, 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 the myth of just desserts, right? And why does it not stand up to scrutiny? Uh, there are some wonderful examples of stuff that's been written about this. Uh, a guy by the name of uh, Dr. Leroy Pelton, who is a PhD uh, social worker, uh, wrote a wonderful short article called, um, What Do We Deserve? And basically his argument is, we don't deserve anything. Um, and one of the things he says is, uh, there is this uh, wonderful uh, notion that if you work hard, you will do better. Um, well, that's because people start with a huge privilege and an advantage. So sure, they're gonna do better. Uh, and you start thinking about that. And um, there's another wonderful book called The Tyranny of Merit by uh, Michael Sandel, uh, very worth reading. And he basically says uh, what uh, Pelton is saying. Uh, there was an assumption about um, the <clears throat> that whole notion that everybody starts at the same place, which of course is ridiculous. Uh, and we know that uh, some people uh, acknowledge that, many people won't. And this is part of the institutional racism that's uh, so endemic uh, in our system. Um, you know, the, the notion that somehow if you just work hard, uh, you're gonna do just fine. And then you look at the 45% of the people experiencing homelessness, they're working hard. Uh, and where do they end up? They end up on the streets. And people talk about jobs and one of the reactions I have is, can you imagine standing on a street corner in all kinds of weather with a cardboard sign and asking for money when 95% of the people pass you by and totally ignore you? Or they look away because they don't want to see you. And you get pittance for it. Uh, I can't think of a worse job. Um, so where is the merit? Uh, and somehow we really have to think through uh, this tyranny of merit. I wanted to say one more thing about paternalism. What would happen if Uncle Sam told us how we should use our tax rebate every year? We would be up in arms, absolutely up in arms. But we're telling people experiencing homelessness how they should uh, utilize their money. And we won't give them money because uh, we uh, assume that they're um, dirty, uh, they're uh, undeserving, uh, and they'll just go and use it for uh, alcohol and drugs. Where, uh, and Kevin knows this because of his pilot project, and there are 
all kinds of research that's going on, uh, particularly in Canada and California. Uh, people use the money very, very well, much better than um, we would. Um, so, sorry to be so long with it. There's so much good stuff in this book. You're right, Kevin. We could spend hours talking about it. So this conversation is just a teaser of the, the brilliant stuff. So you should definitely read the full book and not rely on this conversation to tell you all the good things. Um, so I'm going to read this quick quote for the book because I don't want to get it wrong. But in chapter eight, you talk about you say housing status is considered by medical practitioners to be a more accurate metric for establishing disease risk than diet, exercise, medical history, or even biological age. I found that so incredibly interesting. Um, can you talk, Can uh, Kevin and Don, can you talk a little bit about how healthcare, um, both physical and mental, intersect with homelessness? Maybe talk to us a little bit about the life expectancy and, and what that vicious cycle of that relationship looks like. Kevin, why don't you start? Because I, I will add some stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, you know, again, try to keep it super brief. I mean, housing is healthcare. Housing is healthcare. And as a nation, there was a time not too long ago where we thought, well, you have to get mm -hmm. all your mental and behavioral health issues right before you have the right to housing, before you have this privilege. I don't think housing should be, uh, you know, available to people that we just say, oh, you're, you know, house, housing is a human right. Uh, and if we don't believe that, we're going to pay for it and we are paying for it. Uh, so it's not just an ethical or moral choice. It's a financial one. Uh, we are paying through the roof and the payment is uh, the cost of each person to maintain a person on the streets in terms of police fire, emergency services, sanitation, uh, the uh, shelter system. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars per person per year to maintain someone on the streets for a year. So um, I, I have had done this work for about 10 or 11 years now. I've lost uh, dozens of friends in this time. Uh, I believe the average life expectancy is around 52 years of age. It's about 30 years less than what you might expect uh, if the person was housed. So we're losing not only quantity of years uh, by having people homeless, but it's also the quality of those years. Uh, the amount of conditions my, uh, my, my uh, partner is an emergency medicine physician. She sees some of the same patients every, every week, if not multiple times a week, uh, in and out of the emergency room, sometimes for you know, very ur urgent issues, but sometimes as a waiting room uh, or because the access to health is so difficult for our in-house neighbors. Uh, so I, I just, you know, I, I believe that we have some choices to make and trade-offs to make. We cannot be for ending homelessness, which I know all of us are for, and against building affordable housing in our communities. You can pick one or the other. <laughs> you can either say we don't want new neighbors we don't want you know we just want to keep the local character exactly as it is and and just so you know the neighborhood down the street and the community down the street they're probably going to say the same thing you say so choose wisely uh but yeah i, I think I, I would just say that uh the amount of health conditions our in-house neighbors have is horrific and we're, i know we're not gonna have too much time to talk about this in this conversation but this really gets into some of the mental and behavioral health issues uh, we often think of those as causal to homelessness. They're much more of an effect of homelessness, uh, self-medicating, uh, falling, you know, being, if, if we have an opioid crisis, which we do among housed and unhoused, and we have uh, uh, communities like right now in San Francisco where drugs are present on the streets 24-7, who is going to be the most victimized, uh, the most likely to be uh, taken advantage of by folks who are dealing drugs, selling drugs. Uh, it's our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Uh, so I, I just think we need to look at housing as a human right, as an essential, and to look at the effect of homelessness. I love this concept of social determinants of homelessness. Don put forward 
uh, to, to get past this idea that uh, someone is, uh, you know, as a result of bad choices they're making, falling into homelessness, uh, home, you know, addiction is a, is a disease, uh, and we need to start treating it as such. So, uh, I would add one thing to what Kevin just said, um, and I would ask Rebecca and uh, Dr. Woody, have you ever made a bad decision? Oh, no. Um, I have not, actually. No. Oh, never, well, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I should have known that, um, <laughs> but please forgive me. Well, unlike David Woody, probably every other day, Don. <laughs> <laughs> Never, never. Rebecca's like I've made a bad choice just coming to here today, folks. I I I I, I miss my lunch. <laughs> um, no, that was not a bad decision. So, why are we penalizing people experiencing homelessness for making bad decisions? I make them all the time. Um, I make bad choices. Uh, so, and, and one of the things that. Uh, um, I often say is um, if your brother or sister, your aunt or uncle, your cousin, your nephew was experiencing homelessness, everybody would do absolutely everything to get them into a good, safe, secure place to live. Why don't we do that for people experiencing homelessness? And my argument and Kevin's argument is everybody is somebody's somebody. Everybody experiencing homelessness is somebody's son, daughter, and uncle, et cetera, et cetera. So why are we insisting on, that they are problems to be solved rather than people to be loved. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. Um, oh, Dr. Woody, I'm sorry. I'm stealing your question. You go right ahead. <laughs> Just want to work them back to, you know, Kevin's uh, description of San Francisco and kind of what's going on. Kevin, I was there. Um, at a homelessness conference uh, last week um, and shocked, frankly, even, you know, to walk by, frankly, um, the dynamics there. Um, the book talks a lot about how folks responded to um, the earthquake, San Francisco, 1906, um, and how public uh, entities and the government work together. Um, but I was really moved in the book by this whole concept, um, Kevin and Don, of radical hospitality. Could you say a little bit more about that? Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, I, I mean, people are people are pissed right now, and I don't blame them. I'm pissed, right? Like just to the level with you, I, it's it's infuriating to see the conditions on the streets. It's not safe. It's not safe for our in-house neighbors. It's not safe for our families, our kids walking around. We used to do outreach events in the Tenderloin, bringing volunteers at night, talking to folks. We stopped that because I didn't think I could uh, provide uh, a reasonable assurance of safety uh, to to the events. Folks are sick on the streets. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Like there are people who have severe mental health issues, substance abuse issues. Um, it's not the majority of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, it's very visible. It's a very visible minority. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's no quality of life. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's things we're not going to have a time to really unpack here. But uh, I do think there is a limited but important role for um, involuntary holds, involuntary treatment. My views on this, while they may be controversial and kind of liberal orthodoxy, have been heavily influenced by having conversations with families, listening to families who say, this is no quality of life for my loved one being on the streets, living and dying, out of their mind, not knowing what to do. There's trade-offs of agency, free will, freedom. 
Uh, but what I would say is I, I, I think even if we talk about this, the rub isn't so much in the limited role that I think there is for getting people the help they need. It's, did you exhaust every possibility leading into that? Uh, did you, uh, are they a harm to themselves or others? And most importantly, and most crucially, what's the plan afterwards? Because we don't want to go back to one flew over the cuckoo's nest. We don't want to go back to institutions, locking people up, throwing away the key. That's dehumanizing as well. But I think we've swung too far in the other direction of just letting people live and die on our streets. Um, and, you know, what I'd say is in 1906, after the earthquake, uh, you know, we in a city at the time of 200, uh, 400,000 uh, residents, 250,000 people experienced homelessness. And it wasn't a time of, uh, you know, uh, uh, bans on uh, camping, not in my backyard movements, uh, people getting arrested for feeding people in Golden Gate Park. No, we came together. We allowed uh, earthquake cottages to be erected in Golden Gate Park. People contributed $2 a month to the $50 cost of their cottage. And then once they paid it off, they moved it into neighborhoods throughout San Francisco in what became one of the first examples nationwide of scatter site housing. Uh, and those houses, I've visited some of them. They're still around, these little earthquake cottages. Um, so to me, I, I think as human beings, we actually know exactly how to respond in times of crisis. It's what uh, Charles E. Fritz described as the emergence of the therapeutic community. Short-lived, it's not long-lasting, but there is a moment right after a natural disaster where you, you know, the, 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 the water subsides, the last of the fire is, is put out, you emerge from this in a new normal and you see the people who have had it worse than you, and you just want to support and love on them. That's the radical hospitality that we exhibit time and time again after natural disasters. I think we have to start looking at homelessness in terms of perhaps the highly private, invisible disaster that it is, uh, and not look at questions of deservedness, choice. Did you even when we talk about did you do something wrong or choice? It's a little bit the wrong question because you're right. We're all making choices all the time. There's no uh, connection between making bad life choices and homelessness. Uh, we have to look at folks having survived in a, a very familiar set of circumstances of broken systems and failures in humanity um, and respond to them likewise. But I, I look to events like post-disaster as a time for inspiration uh, because I do think even in the worst moments of our human experience, we can see the best moments of humanity. Uh, and that's my hope of what we see going forward around homelessness. Is there anything, Don or Kevin, Dr. Woody, I think this has been an incredible conversation. Is there anything before we wrap up today that you'd like to uh, say, anything that we didn't get to or that you find important to mention before we close today? Uh, I would say that uh, in addition to reading our book, uh, which clearly is very important, um, my hope is that people will stop and think a bit about where their heads are around this issue and begin to shift gears. Uh, if that can happen, then uh, we will all be in a much better place. Uh, so, uh, and you know, I, I've gotten calls and emails from people who talk about the book and want me to be part of a book group and so on and so forth. So I think there is a, there's a group of folks who really are thinking, beginning to think differently. And I find that very optimistic. Um, so uh, Kevin, thank you very much for writing this book. No, Don, thank you for, working with me to write it, uh, it wouldn't have happened without uh, our partnership. Don has been an incredible friend, mentor, 
Uh, he's just, he's, he's a very humble guy. Uh, he's been a little less humble in this conversation, so you got to forgive him, but no, he's one of the kindest human beings I've ever met and, and just a nationwide leader on this issue. So, uh, the honor is mine, Don. And, and what I just share to everyone, aside from this love fest that Don and I just had for a few seconds there. Um, so a couple things, uh, would love it if you read the book, if you love it, let us know if you hate it. You disagree with it. You push back. It doesn't work in your community. You guys miss this whole thing. What are you talking about? Let us know. Like this is not meant to be a conversation stopper. It's meant to continue the conversation and foster conversation. Uh, invite you to, to share your thoughts, experiences with us, uh, social media, easy to find Kevin F. Adler, uh, Miracle Messages is the nonprofit, uh, Amazon, Goodreads is great places to leave reviews, however you feel about the book. Um, and then what I'd really say beyond the book. Uh, so uh, if you care about this issue of homelessness and clearly all hundred plus of you have joined for this call, hundreds more tune in later, thousands more, millions more, maybe we'll see what moments go viral. Um, you care about the issue of homelessness. Do you know someone who's currently experiencing homelessness as a friend or as a neighbor? If you don't, no shame, right? First time I met an unhoused neighbor who wasn't my uncle. I approached them in broad daylight on the street corner to do the GoPro thing. I grabbed my keys instinctively as a weapon and held them in the palm of my hand. So that's where I started on this issue. And I'm constantly encountering my own biases. Dr. Woody's going to send me an angry email after this. Be like, yo, you, you messed up on a few of these things. And that's good. I, I invite that. This is not an issue. We have enough shaming in our society. We have enough feeling guilty. We have enough. Are you saying the right thing or not? This is actually an issue where we're, we should be getting it wrong, but we should be getting it wrong in conversation. Otherwise, we're going to just sit with our wrong views and our preconceptions. So I'd invite you into conversation with us, with community members around you through this book. And if you'd like to get involved and connect with an unhoused neighbor and you're not quite sure where to start, if you go to miraclemessages.org, we have a phone buddy program. We'll match you anywhere in the country for a weekly phone call text message. 20 minutes, 30 minutes a week, one-to-one -one, uh, with an unhoused friend. We provide all the training, the support. You're part of a community. Uh, so we just invite you into that um, or learn more about other ways to get involved in our basic income work, our reunion work at our website, miraclemessages.org. But Dr. Woody, Rebecca, I just want to thank you uh, most of all for really facilitating these hard conversations that are absolutely essential. Uh, I want to echo what Kevin just said. Uh, I am very, very grateful to both of you, uh, Dr. Woody and Rebecca, for inviting us to uh, participate in this uh, hard conversation. Uh, may all of your conversations go as well as I thought uh, this would give. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. They don't call it hard conversations for nothing. Like, I love this call out, Kevin, to say this is the beginning of the conversation. If we're not getting it wrong, if we're not talking about hard things, feeling a little bit uncomfortable, then we're probably not trying enough. So I love that. Um, Dr. Woody, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And it's been an incredible conversation. <laughs> Um, and Kevin and Don, thank you so much for your amazing scholarship that is clearly making a difference in the world and for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Um, it takes all of us to end homelessness. We are all neighbors, no matter your address. And we invite you to look for ways to volunteer, to advocate, which uh, Kevin and Don gave you some uh some kind of opportunities there and give towards the work in your community today. So thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.